Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy, where we take philosophy, mix it with beer, and apply it to the questions you deal with every day. Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy. I'm Anastasia here with Mike and John, and this week we're discussing uh, shutdowns, filibusters, and denying quorum. But before we can get to the episode, I'm going to read from this book. Just, just anything from the book at random? Having no personal commitment to either of the new consuls, Gaius Julius Caesar and his sons simply tacked themselves onto the procession which started nearest to their own house, the procession of the senior consul. Surely one of you guys is going to stop me. I just want to know what nope. the hell we're doing here. <laughs> oh, she's <laughs> filibustering. You're filibustering. Yeah. I understand. I, yeah. Actually, I was. I, you were getting into Julius Caesar, and I was going to start talking about Cicero and get, jump all into this. <laughs> That's funny because... Uh, I, I actually just grabbed like the most dictionary book that I had because I was going to say that I was going to read from the dictionary and then I realized that I didn't own a dictionary. Know where to, I didn't yeah. own a dictionary yeah. and I didn't know where to start in the dictionary. So I'm confused. Have you joined the filibuster or are we going to the beer at some point? Well, I don't know. She 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 didn't uh, she did not allow me to, uh, to to intervene for a question, so I'm not really sure. So okay, um, okay. So what are we doing? Uh, first, we're going to talk about what beer we're drinking. We are drinking Kentucky Bourbon Barrel Coffee Stout. I don't know who makes it. It's from Lexington, Kentucky. <laughs> It is from the Lexington Brewing Company in Lexington, Kentucky. I'm completely prepared. I was sitting here reading this, trying to find it. I can't find it anywhere on here. Did that throw you off? Part, well, of, the, part of it is I can't read any of the writing on here except for the, 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 the great big bold shit on it. Yes. So It's the Alltex Lexington Brewing So Company. another oh. bourbon barrel this, this week. Yes, uh, we've yes. kind of been I'm, on a I'm kick. I'm kind of excited about this. Uh, this, this, ought to be, this ought to be a little bit of fun. Okay. So what is our topic now? Shutdowns, filibusters, and my favorite... Denying quorum. I'm kind of excited about this. <laughs> we are we are uh, extensively underprepared for this show. Blaine, can you do us a favor and go into the living room on our little wine rack thing? You'll find three uh, flute shaped glasses for us to enjoy this beer out of. Yes, yes we got we got to have a flute shaped yeah, glass for this one. This glass. is important. So. I mean, I guess. You know, this has been kind of a, 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 a big deal in, in recent years. Uh, mm -hmm. I can remember when I was a kid, the idea of a, a, of a filibuster was something that, that happened so very, very rare. Mm -hmm. but, but, you know, it, it's been uh, particularly in the last eight to ten years, it has really exploded in usage. Right. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's kind of cool. Let's, talk, let's start off talking about shutdowns a little bit here uh, yes. and, and, and the value of a government shutdown. <laughs> what, what is it? What is a shutdown to you? First off, that's kind of where I like to start the shows. Oh, Blaine, Blaine, no, no, no. The the beer ones, not the uh, the champagne ones. They're on the very front, in oh. front of. Yeah. yeah, the tulip glasses. Yes. Sorry. Anyway, um, what is? Yeah, Blaine. Yeah. Can't get good help around you here. Can't get good help, especially when you don't pay them. Yeah, absolutely. So y your question was, what was the value of a government shutdown? No, what is? Yeah, what a is a shutdown? I mean, really. Oh, what I, is it? I think most Americans don't really understand what a shutdown is. What is it in practice, or what is it in theory? Well, let's let's let's, let's kind of just, just just your your idea of a shutdown. Now, you're obviously an educated person, but yeah. Just, just your basic understanding of a shutdown. Yeah, so my basic understanding of a shutdown is the same thing that uh, happens every night at a store. You lock the doors and you shut it down, right? Yep, yep. Um, Thank you. I, I don't really have much more than that for, for what a shutdown yep, yep, is. Yep. It seems pretty basic. So, um, in theory, the government runs out of money. Um, and Or rather, runs out of spending authorization and cannot pay for things. And the way that we seem to experience government shutdowns is that most of the government still functions, um, but they stop providing services like um, staffing national parks and, well, even allowing people into national parks and yeah, I would say a disappointing amount of the government still functions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, the the original idea of a shutdown uh, was was to to completely shut down the government in order to put political force on 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 one party or the other mm -hmm. in order to force legislation. Now, was that the original idea? Because when I think about it, and, and I, I do completely agree that that's what what has happened. That's what it's become. It's kind of the executive branch's filibuster. But to me, when I, when I when I was hearing about it, and maybe this was just some layman's understanding of the thing, it was we just don't have money, 
and we're not authorized to spend money, ergo, we can't do anything else because that would spend money. I mean, I, I, I think I think that's what 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 they sold it as. But if you ever ever look back and in, 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 in all my reading on this, every shutdown we've ever had has been a political tool. Yeah. It has been there in order to force a vote or or or, or you'll, you'll force a movement uh, somewhere. Even, you know, the Grant administration where there was a there was a shutdown because they were they were out of money. But in that case what had happened was uh, the you know the Congress would 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 appropriate all of this money and the, and the it was the uh, it was Veterans Affairs that during the Grant administration uh, that they were dealing with and they'd appropriated this money. Well, the administration used all that money up in uh, you know six nine months, mm -hmm. and they would come back to Congress and and demand that Congress make an make an, an an amendment to it. Well, let me ask a theoretical then: Does the shutdown, the layman's uh, uh, understanding of we just can't operate the government anymore, can that even exist? Is is that even like a, a thing where? Where that could happen, or would they just say to hell with the rules and go, or, or something in the middle? Is that a possibility? Well, I, I, I think it is. Um, I, I don't think there's been the political uh, political will to do it in a long time. Again, back to that Grant administration thing. Uh, Grant just came out and said, uh, said said no, you you've spent all the money that you have. I'm not. Uh, you know, we're 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 shutting it down. And uh, you know, uh, again, his argument was. You know that we were broke, but the but it was really a tool to force them in the next session to to live within their means to 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 not spend in excess. Which is ironically the exact opposite of what it's been in. in Which in, is the exact opposite of what it's become now. Yeah. Today, it's uh, you know it's it's used in the opposite direction to uh, to try and force the government oftentimes to spend more money. Right. Uh, but do you do you think shutdown is a le is it a legitimate use of power? Yeah, I, I mean. I think it's one of the few, uh, yeah, because um, now I say that there's this other thing. It's not in the past been called a shutdown, but where the executive branch will come in and, and, and they'll be ordered to do something with funding and, and all that. And they'll say, well, I get to determine the way in which it's done and the way in which I'm going to do it is not right. And that that's kind of a, akin to shutting down something. But I, I, for some reason in my mind, that's a lot less legitimate use than saying, well, you told me to work within bo the box of, you know, walls A, B, and C, and we've hit wall C. So, you know, there's no, no more to do. Uh, but but isn't that isn't that what's supposed to happen at that point? I mean, if you if, oh. if, if, if you're if you've used your money up, if you've used what's appropriated, aren't they then supposed to just say, "I'm sorry, we don't have any more"? Yeah. yeah well, and, and and I've I've done that kind of thing within within deliberative bodies where I've I've said, you know, that that they'll be they'll be bickering over how much how many credit card fees you know we can pay you know on, on a term, and I'll say, "All right, guys, if if y'all want to limit these credit card fees, I do understand that." We need to not spend money, but the second we hit the, our limit on the credit card fees, I'm shutting down the donation link because we'll have to pay credit card fees if we take those, and we're not taking any more money. And uh, you know, was that a political tool when I did it? I, I mean, I, I think it was a, a persuasive argument. So I guess yeah, that that to some extent was a political tool. But on the other hand, I think those are the bounds that I was supposed to work in when I'm told you can't spend more than X on credit card yeah, fees. Yeah. Right. Here, here's the argument that's made. Uh, the argument that's made is that that the U.S. Congress, uh, particularly the House of Representatives, has 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 the sole power when it comes to to uh, to funding the government. Mm -hmm. uh, all all spending all appropriation bills have to start in the House of Representatives. It's got to go through this system. If the Constitution gives the Congress this authority, is it then? Uh, a, a, an abuse of power for the president to come in and uh, uh, you know shut the government down uh, by, b because they're not living within that, that system isn't it isn't it also Congress's right to come in and adjust that is I guess what I'm trying to get to yeah I mean it's it's absolutely Congress's right to to adjust it uh, I guess and maybe I've missed some key point in this this argument it's kind of gone over my head. Uh, are we talking about the situation in which we have actually hit a wall um, where Congress hasn't appropriated the funds? Or are we talking about some other situation where the president just doesn't like the the far out boundary that Congress has set? You know, what I mean, I think those are kind of two different situations. I, I think so, too. Uh, but but even then, even then, as the president, as the executive leader, is he exceeding his authority 
or is he doing what he what he was elected to do whenever he says look the people elected me to to get control of this and this is a tool i'm using to get control of it you know uh, I, I i don't know what the right answer is here i, I tend to think yes i i think the the correct tool for him to use would be a veto on the budget itself uh or or something of that nature but i th- I think once it's passed, he is acting as a, a third branch of Congress when he says, no, I'm not going to do what, what Congress has passed. Well, I, I don't know, because we've seen the instance where they have refused to pass a budget, um, which, well, they've ref- refused to pass a, bu- a budget and spending authorization. And with that, I think it is not only well within the executive branch's authority but the thing that should be done to say we no longer have spending authority we can't spend and therefore effectively the government is shut down yeah well you've got situations where, where you have you have gridlock in the house mm-hmm. or, you know you've got situations like uh, uh probably in, in the modern era you can go to 1980 uh ronald reagan's up here and the federal trade commission spent all of their money they were broke and this deadlock Congress could not pass a uh, could not pass a, a, a continuing resolution to, to fund them. So what happens? Well, it, the, the government got shut down. Uh, th- this affected well the Federal Trade Commission got shut down. This affected about eighteen hundred workers, mm-hmm. uh, and I think that was a tool to try and force Congress to uh, you know to, to fund that. Uh, but my, my I wonder whether that was the right thing to do. Uh, the furlough of this government, I don't know where these numbers came from. I found it on the wiki, but it said it cost the government about $700,000 to, to to furlough those people for, for a day mm-hmm. uh, by, by the time it came out, which is, you know, it's not a lot of money when you look at the at the vast yeah. scope of the government, but that's still $700,000 right. for, for a day. Was the right thing to do to be to, to shut the government down in an instance like that, or was the right thing to do to, to, to say, look, we know they're going to go up. They're doing essential work. Uh, Congress Congress should act together. I, I don't know what the right answer is here. Now, now, say that again. We know they're going to go up. What does go up mean in that case? But we, we, know, we know the government is not going to let the Federal Trade Commission continue not to operate. No, no, no. I, I don't think you get to say that at all. I, and I'll refer back to our recent episode on do treaties trump the Constitution. And we argued in that, that episode that the that – the, or the argument – one of the arguments that was made in that episode was that the president has the right to sign uh, treaties that may not get – come to fruition because the president has the right to lie. But that he cannot know that Congress is then going to act – to enact laws to back that constitution. And if we're going to make the argument – to, to back that treaty, yes, sorry, uh, uh, Freudian slip there. Uh, but if if we're going to make the argument that the president can't know in that situation whether or not that this treaty is going to be backed, we can't then turn around and make the argument that the president has some kind of clairvoyance radiating out of Congress that he can then act on in this situation. Okay, I, I, now I, I'm talking I'm talking pragmatically here. I think I think legally you're correct. I think legally you can't you can't know that they're going to do it, but I think pragmatically, we knew that Congress was not going to allow the Federal Trade Commission not to operate, mm-hmm. um, and and then you know, what what do you do in a situation like that? I I don't know what the right thing is to do. Well, and and if you're going to make the pragmatic argument, I would refer back to our episode we recently did on torture, and the conclusion that at least I came to in that episode, I think there was some agreement there. Is the 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 way that we should handle torture is no we shouldn't legalize it but if you're so so sure that there's a bomb in New York this terrorist knows where that bomb is and you can get out of him go ahead but you're gonna have to stand trial for it and I make the same argument here if you you absolutely know this is gonna pass go ahead and do it but be ready to stand trial for it and I think most presidents say I'm not gonna sit on trial because they won't do their job and I, I would absolutely respect their decision to say that. I, I think I think it's a different situation, uh, and, and I, I can't even tell you why I think it's different. I'm looking at it and I'm going, you know, one is a life or death situation, and the other is the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, but uh, again, it's the historian in me that looks at it and says that that there was no way you, that the president loses that one. There was no way that 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 the FTC continues not to operate. Um, there's been some other ones, other shutdowns that I think are. Uh, are, are actually really good shutdowns. Uh, 
when when George H. W. Bush was president, uh, y'all are too young to remember, but I know you've all seen it on YouTube and everything else. But when he's H. the one that grabs asses, right? It, it, yeah, no. yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. If he yeah. was grabbing asses, then we weren't aware of it. Okay, um, okay. Or it was okay then. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Different time. When uh, when H. W. Bush ran for for election. His most famous quote, and I'm sure you all know what it is, read my lips, no new taxes. Yeah. He had promised no new taxes. Well, then legislation came about uh, and, uh, and, and and the taxes went up under under H.W. Bush. His own party shut down the government over this. Mm -hmm. His own party shut it down. And the reason they did is they said, you, you made a promise to the American people and, yeah. and, and you've gone against it. Uh, now, it was over a Columbus Day weekend and it was uh, one of the systems where most of the government wasn't operating anyway. But um, – you know, it, it affected about 2,800 workers, uh, and it's it. They talk about the furlough of this one cost. Uh, those workers lost a total of about 2.57 million in revenue by the time it was over with. It was a big amount of. Uh, of, of it was it was a pretty big effect. Um, what do you think about something like that? That wasn't a matter of necessity. That was sending a message to the president. <sighs> So I mean, that was Congress shutting down the government. Yeah, it, it was. And th this is a tough one for me because this is one of those topics. And, and we're going to be jumping in and out of Robert's Rules here. And this is one where, where I, my history and everything can really uh, help play in this one. When you look at deliberative bodies with a really shallow understanding of a deliberative body, your initial thought seems to come to well the the body was sending a message to the president or the body was clearly doing it because of this there was an intent here however when you actually start to get into the nitty-gritty of what that means and i'll give you a really good example here in a second it's not that clear cut what the intent of a body is it's not even clear cut that the body knows what the intent of a body is here's an example uh, the amendment, and Mike, you're going to have to come in and help me here. The amendment that says that people born on American soil are American citizens. Uh, 14th. <laughs> 14th Amendment. When the 14th Amendment goes through, there were a lot of headlines coming out on what the intent of this was. Yeah. And those headlines were contradictory. And those headlines were backed by interviews from the people who passed the actual amendment, and the interviews were contradictory. Yeah, different people were passing it for different reasons. <laughs> yeah. When you start looking at deliberative bodies, even on, on much more clear-cut issues, there is an emergent behavior that evolves where the body itself, what comes out of that body, almost becomes, now nobody can point to it, but almost becomes a new consciousness, a new thing with its own will, but that no one person has, has the privilege of having the information of their will. They all have the individual pieces. And what... I have found to be helpful in looking at this is to not try and derive intent from these kind of things, except for when resolutions are passed alongside the law or motion to uh, clarify intent, because I have found so many times when to me the intent was so clear and it wasn't. Maybe there was legislat legislators in there who weren't just trying to send a message to the president to do something different. Uh, they oh, were, and there were. There yeah, were. Yeah, exactly. So I, well, you had Ron Paul in there. Yeah. So I, I think it, it's 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 really easy to point to this on a shallow level, but it becomes a really choppy and difficult topic when you go below the surface. Yeah, I I, I don't think it is in this case. Uh, uh, yes, there were some that, that you know. Ron Paul voted against it because he didn't believe in, in, in you know, he believed in shrinking the government. Yeah. But whenever the president's own party is the one doing it, and and then you can look and see that they, you know, they that they, they they chose a Columbus Day weekend to do it. They chose a weekend where, you know, the fewest amount of people would be would be affected. Uh, to me, it was about headline grabbing and sending a message at that point. And we know that because they then passed they then passed the the, the tax bill. Yeah. Uh, you know, if, they, if if it was really about about stopping it, they would have stopped the tax bill. They yeah. didn't. They shut the government down to send a message and to be able to campaign on the fact that you know I know I, you know I supported President Bush when he said read my lips no new taxes and I fought him when he raised taxes. Well, you fought him once. Yeah. And then you voted for it later. Yeah, it's it's really funny to me going back really quickly to that emergent behavior uh, of deliberative bodies. Um, it's really funny when I because I've seen a few things like this past where 
they kick the can down the road with the intent, sometimes even written clearly into the wording of things, with the intent that something will happen later. And between then and the later, elections are held or somebody quits the body or somebody dies or whatever that case is. And the body completely changes. And it's if that new consciousness has changed its mind in the middle. But the thing that was supposed to happen can now be redirected in a new direction. For instance, shutting down the government. It, it may be easy to, to shut it down over a Columbus Day weekend um, and then bring it back up. But then let's say something happens, tragedy strikes, and a few people die. And all of a sudden the makeup of that body is different. And they say, okay, well, we've gotten it to shut down. Now we can really kind of mess with these budget items because we can turn the screws on it now. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Put the pressure on him. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I think that 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 has happened a few times. Uh, one of the, the one of the best examples. Now, all these so far, the typical government shutdown mm -hmm. has been for a day or a long weekend. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But this all changes. I talk about about the modern era now. Modern to me, you know, Bill Clinton administration is a very modern modern time to me. And during the Bill Clinton administration, you had a you had this weird situation where you had this extremely popular president that was the leader of the minority party. The Republicans were in charge of of, of the House and the Senate. Uh, Newt Gingrich, with his contract of, with America, had swept the House. They controlled the House and the Senate for the first time in forty years. Um, the Democrats were out of control, but you had a popular Democrat president, and. We had a, a face-off, uh, and it was it was largely a personality war between Speaker of the House Newt Gingrich and President Bill Clinton uh, over you know over th these this this budget, and the Republicans had put forward a budget that had uh, had kept the promises that they had outlined in the contract of, with America to to cut the budget and particularly to cut uh, uh, domestic spending and welfare type spending, uh, entitlement spending, uh, to, to use the terms they would have used. Well, uh, Bill Clinton refused to sign that legislation and, and the government shut down and everybody thought it was going to be, be, be pretty fast. Uh, this led to a 27 day shutdown. Our government was shut down for 27 days. Now, essential th things were still operating, but it was a, it, it was a much larger shutdown than we've seen before. Uh, it, it really was pretty much your essential items that, that, that continued to operate. Um, like what? Uh, this was at the point where, you know, law enforcement continued to be, to be funded. Uh, the military continued to be funded. Uh, you know, they, they were still getting their checks, but your, uh, your, your social security checks stopped your, your, uh, all of those, th that stuff all stopped. Mm -hmm. Now they got their back pay eventually and all, all this right. stuff came back. But for 27 days, people felt the pain of this mm -hmm. and it was intentionally uh, done to feel the pain. Some of the laws that were passed during this time is they, they started talking about this, uh, the importance of this and, and what would be required. And um, to the point that they required that, that government officials turn in their, uh, their, uh, their computers and their phones and all this stuff. Uh, they weren't allowed to check their email during this time mm -hmm. period. Uh, and, and it was all about coming through and, and putting as much pain on the, on, on the people as possible. Um, this was something really, uh, really unique because uh, it managed to, to energize both bases. And when it was over with, a compromise was reached. They uh, right. part of the budget came out. Uh, uh, you know, there were cuts, but they weren't as draconian as as uh, as, as Gingrich had promised. Both sides were able to claim victory, and uh, you know, Bill Clinton energized his base, and Newt Gingrich energized his base. Right. So it was something that, that that both sides seemed to claim victory on. What did happen though was after this, Americans were less willing to have these long shutdowns mm -hmm. because their memory was there and they remembered mama didn't get her didn't get her social security check or my brother didn't get his unemployment check or, or something to, to this effect mm -hmm. and uh I, the, the tool was used very very strictly there do you think what was done there was an appropriate use of, of power i can appreciate clinton standing on standing for what he believed was right um, and and refusing to sign that legislation, yeah. Not yeah. saying I necessarily agree with him, but I think he stood up for what he believed in. Well, and he was in a place where, where while his party was in, my, in a minority, it had enough votes that the Republicans couldn't override his veto. Right. Yeah, I, I, I think absolutely so. And, you know, I'm... I am sure that like a large portion of our listeners 
are all going to be irritated at me, yet agree with me for the other listeners that are irritated with me for other reasons. Uh, but I, I found this really funny dialogue going on in America where Americans tend to um, be against, not like, people who live off the government. They're freeloaders. They, uh, they, they, they don't contribute enough and all that. But it's funny to me how this shutdown reveals how many of us really are that same person. And every single one of them sure, sure. is going to explain to you how theirs is different. Right. They're living off the government. Isn't theirs like all those legitimate. other people yeah. that live off the government. They have the right way to do it. And it's really the other freeloaders out of the problem. Same yeah, thing you yeah. have with Congress. My congressman is great. It's those other assholes. Right? Yeah, I, I, I can completely relate to that because I've been in that position where I've, you know, shut it down, shut it down, shut it down. And I sit here and go. Part of my salary comes from the federal government. Yeah, and I'm, I'm a school teacher, so I get yeah. part of yeah. my salary from it. Uh, personally, I wish we shut the government down on a regular basis, but yeah. that's, that's, we do. that's me. Uh, well, well, kind of. Yeah, kind of. We shut the government down, but it it really genuinely seems like the only thing these days that's yeah. not functioning is the national parks, and even those still have security to keep people from. Yeah, the, the 95, 96 shutdowns, those, uh, those, those really rough ones with Clinton, that was the last time we had a large scale shutdown. Well, We've had other shutdowns, but they, they, they were called shutdowns. Yeah, well, and, and, and let me say, uh, uh, back to the original question you asked, was it legitimate? Yes, I think it was legitimate. And I think the people that are going to point to its illegitimacy are going to point to themselves, that this is a little further back, so maybe they're going to point to their parents or maybe possibly grandparents and say, well, it wasn't legitimate because that hurt grandma and yeah. we can't legitimately hurt grandma. Uh, but I think a lot of those people are also going to think that parts of it were legitimate. We don't need these other freeloaders or they don't mind so much the, the actual employees of the government not getting their check because th that's something they sign up for. What, what I found interesting about that particular shutdown is Bill Clinton's argument here. Uh, Bill Clinton quoted Andrew Jackson. Uh, you know, Andrew Jackson was the first Democrat, so you know the first first person to call himself a Democrat. And uh, Andrew Jackson once said that he was he, he referred to the presidency as the Tribune of the People. And what he meant by that was, your congressman is voted for by people in your congressional district. Mm -hmm. Your senator is voted for people in your state. The president is the only person that was voted on by all of the people in all of the states. Yeah. And an and, argument that's been made a lot since yeah, then. And Clinton made that argument. And his argument here was, was uh, you, you know, that, that, that in, in reality, I am the voice of the people and I have to be here to protect the people. It's not the House that's the voice of the people. Right. The House is the voice of their district. Yeah. So I thought it was an interesting argument anyway. Well, I think that's interesting. Uh, I think that plays to another argument that's not part of the show. But if he's going to argue that because he was the only one voted on by the people, he's the voice of the people, uh, there, there's a, a lively debate right now over whether celebrities should use their voice for political influence. They're voted on with much more vigor and, and turnout than presidents ever were. So is your American Idol winner the real voice of the people? <laughs> Let's let's not elect them for president, yeah. though. I'm just saying the ones that voted we on them Trump. were really the electoral college. So maybe they're the voice of the electoral college. Well, you know, they were indirectly voted on mm -hmm. by the people. But yes, you're right. You're yeah. right. But uh, we, 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 we've, topic, we've done a sorry. show on the electoral college. If you want to listen to that one, yeah. is that behind the paywall? No. Wait. Maybe. Yeah, I think, no. You know what? Just to be safe, go to patreon.com slash six pack philosophy, <laughs> pay five dollars, and just in case you, you you'll make sure you have it. You'll That's get right. that. That was a, a good show. More. That was a really good show. Speaking speaking of the paywall shows, I just want to announce to everybody, both our patrons and, and people who are considering being patrons, uh, we've gone through, we've messed with our tagging system, uh, to make it much easier to find our shows behind the paywall. There's actually a tag on the left. I think it's locked episodes it's, it's intuitive but you can click on that now and all the shows behind the paywall just come right to the top and you can browse through those really easily you know nice. I, I i just i just learned about that right here on the show so that's cool yeah that's cool yeah. so yeah by the way mike uh, well you know that that's kind of the way i learn about a lot of a lot of the technical stuff because i don't know yeah. any of it so uh the last big shutdown i want to talk talk about it I, I think this is the one that's the most important because it's it, it's what shutdowns are today, okay? Yeah. Uh, this is the Obama shutdown of 2013. Mm -hmm. And this was over the uh, Obamacare, the Affordable, uh, mm -hmm. what, Affordable, Affordable Care, Care Act. Act. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and what ended up happening here 
was in order to try and to try and stop this, the, the, the Republican led House of Representatives shut the government down in order to try and, 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 and stop the the passage of what was really a pretty popular piece of legislation. Right. Yeah, uh, I, I, I personally was against it and am against it, but it's uh, a very popular uh piece of legislation it was popular in many states it was popular with people it was popular with the courts it was popular everywhere it, it, the courts in particular yes yeah. they, they thought it was uh, very popular but but in this case uh 800 federal employees were put out of work for 16 days but this is the part that i found interesting congress was willing to shut things down for 16 days but they made a stipulation in this they actually required 1.3 million people to work to come into work with deferred payment you're going to come in. We're going to shut down. You're going to. You're not going to get paid that now. That was 16 days of slavery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we're going to pay you, but we're not going to pay you now. So to, is this is this even a shutdown? Which wasn't something they could promise. Uh, no, it it, you're, it wasn't. Uh, especially not when you're looking at 2013. You're looking at something where, uh, you know, you're not too far from an election at that point. Yeah. Well, uh, two two things I want to say on that. First, the, the whole idea of requiring them to come into work with deferred payment. I would require Congress to accept my middle finger with a deferred apology. <laughs> but um, you know, it, it, it's even you know I'm going to say more insidious than that because they actually in some ways brought in extra people. I think of the fact that they were asking law enforcement in Montana to stop people who were stopping on the side of the road to take pictures of Mount Rushmore, not even yeah, on yeah. Mount Rushmore. You can't even look at it because that, that has something to do with the government. It, it should have gotten a really big sheet to hang over it. It wouldn't be that, you know, it was surprisingly not as big as I thought. It'd they probably could have managed it would, it. A, it would be a very big sheet. They'd have, they'd have to call Senator Byrd and get him to pull his KKK robes out to put it up there. They should have. Damn. They should, ooh. <laughs> he was still alive then. It was okay to make that joke damn they should have blocked off the road and put put like a sign with an arrow of uh you you can go to uh what's the other one Indian. sitting bull sitting bull sitting bull sitting bull this way yeah i think it's it? sitting bull yeah sitting okay. bull sitting bull this way that have been out of support yeah, of that yeah, yeah yeah absolutely uh but but that that was kind of interesting to me that that they went through and, and went to the trouble of of saying well we're going to shut down but we're not but it's not going to affect you in any way so, we don't want to have we don't want to pay the consequences yeah to answer your question no that was not a shutdown that was a horse uh, yeah. and pony show it, it was and, and and you know you talked about the the examples there was a the lincoln memorial i remember this there was a kid there it was a boy scout uh in washington dc and for his service project he showed up with a bunch of boy scouts to mow the lawn at the lincoln memorial because it wasn't getting mowed because that yeah. was done and the police came and forced him off and said, "No, you can't. Yeah, you can't that. mow this lawn uh, because we're shut down." Well, you know, it's not the government. So. Yeah. Well, and and, it, and it's funny. You know, we we saw a lot of sentiment, and whether they're right, whether you agree with them, is not the point here. It's it's the point here of the political battles that they're using people as chess pieces in. I remember the quote today. Today was a bad day. The anarchists have won. Yeah. You remember that? Yeah, but it wasn't anarchy. It, it wasn't anarchy by any means, right? So the anarchists weren't really thrilled with it either. But the point is, when voluntary people said, you know what? I understand you don't have money. They, they were taking a, a very you know, realistic and sensible approach to this. We can come together, society, and we can do this together. We, we, we don't need to rely on tax dollars. And the government said, no, no, no. Yes, no, you no, do. No, you, no, you have to no, have tax no, dollars. No. Yeah. yeah. And, and when, when I just want to point out, there was a, a group of people who said, I think this is really important. Whether the government is paying for it or not, I'm going to make sure that it's still around. Yeah, and, and, and let me ask you, you know, I, I know you're you're not anywhere near the area, but for instance, the, the Tomb of the Fallen Soldiers, if you found out there was a government shutdown and nobody was taking care of that, wouldn't you march your ass out there? And, and, uh, the Marine Corps League would have walked it. Yeah. You know, the uh, VFW would have done it. The American Legion would have done it. Mm -hmm. And they wouldn't have charged the dime. They'd That's have right. happily That's done right. it. Uh, you yeah. know, the same people that that, that voluntarily uh, do, do funeral details, yeah. you know, yeah. for, for fallen soldiers, fall, fallen uh, military men. Yeah, uh, I, I think that's that's a, a good argument. Hey, I want to go into the, the more interesting section with the filibuster next. But before we hit that, I think we should talk about this beer a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I think we should. It's going to be gone in a minute. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I've been pacing myself because again, this is a Kentucky bourbon barrel coffee stout. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, who wants to start this one? I, I can go with it. All right. This beer is a very pleasant experience. Um, it's a very slightly sweetened. Uh, 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 smooth. John's addicted to the word very, and it drives me fucking crazy. Like, uh, maybe very I'm just crazy. 
Maybe I'm just addicted to driving you crazy. Yeah, I don't know. That's possible That's too. what um, it is, actually. And but, we're not even married. <laughs> but but it's, it's lightly sweetened. It's smooth. The bitters aren't overpowering. You can definitely taste the coffee. It is a, a pleasant experience. However, I can also say that this is a surprisingly forgettable beer for a bourbon barrel uh, uh, aged beer. Uh, I'm not getting the, the woody notes that you normally do, and that's understandable. The, the bitters of the coffee are going to wash those out. Um, however, I, I find myself at a really torn place because I can't say a lot that's bad about this beer. I can say a lot that's where they missed expectations of a bourbon barrel stout. It would almost be like if you went to drink a bourbon barrel stout and you had a really good wit beer and it's like, what do you call this? Um, all that said, my, I, I'm going to give it a 3.0. It, it is a good beer. It, it's definitely not as far off as a wit beer, but, um, I, I can't really take it much above that because it, it has hit, it has missed so many features of the bourbon barrel where I feel they would have done better if they had just marketed this as a coffee stout and, and it, it would have been fantastic, but there was some, some missed expectations here. Yeah. Um, I, I'll go, I'll go second if that's all right with you, madam mistress. Mm -hmm. Uh, this, uh, I didn't get a number from John 3.0. Okay. This Kentucky bourbon barrel, uh, I, I, I'm going to agree with a lot of what you said. I think that this is an excellent coffee stout. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's a, it, a wonderful beer. It's it, it's just it's just thick enough to to enjoy without mm -hmm. being too much. There's nothing watery about it. Uh, yeah. The 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 flavors are there. There I, I taste a little bit of that woodiness in the background, mm -hmm. but not a lot. I'm not getting the bourbon out of it. Uh, yeah. uh, there, there's just not a whole lot lot to it. And it's an 8.0, uh, so... You're expecting a little bit of burn. <coughs> yeah. And, and you know, I, I don't like the burn of a bourbon barrel, but, I, but I'm expecting that. So it doesn't, it doesn't have the expectation that I, that, that I had come in with it. Uh, that having been said, it is a really good beer, and I yeah. really enjoy it. Uh, I, 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 would, I would highly recommend this to people. I would suggest to my friends that they try this. Uh, this is a beer, beer that I would very much, listen to me, I'm using very mm -hmm. now, I would very much enjoy uh, drinking this around a campfire on a cold night. I think it's it, it would be really good for that. Uh, but I, I'm with you. You've got, to, you've got to, uh, to hit it a little bit for not being what it, what it says it's going to be. And that puts me in that strange place that, that we find ourselves a lot of times. Do you rate a beer as what it is or do you rate a beer as what it claims to be? Yeah, because uh, as a bourbon barrel, if, if if that's what you are trying to get to, I think this is going to disappoint you. It's mm -hmm. not what you're what you're looking for. But if somebody just handed you this beer, I think you would absolutely love it. And uh, you know, I I would have given this uh, a, a three six if it would have been a, just a coffee stout. I think it's that good. Uh, but I'm gonna I'm gonna bump it a couple of them for not not reaching that that level of what it advertises itself to be. And I'm gonna go three three. Okay, um, so. I think I think you guys are missing something here um, because I think with a bourbon barrel ale, the focus is the bourbon barrelness of it. But this isn't this is not advertised as a bourbon barrel ale. It's a bourbon barrel coffee stout. Well, if you would hold on for a minute, and so if Bite this, my ass woman, no. Um, but <laughs> I got you, Mike. I got you. You got it. You got yeah. it. All right. Well, if as long this, as somebody bites my ass, I'm happy. If this were a bourbon barrel ale, then I think the bourbon barrelness of it is going to be a lot bigger focus on it. But this is a bourbon barrel coffee stout, a a beer that is already going to have a whole lot of flavor all on its own, and I suspect that where the bourbon barrel aspects come in is in the muted bitterness of it. Um. You're not getting the bitterness of the coffee, and I think that's probably because of the notes brought in by being aged in the bourbon barrels. Um, you get something a little bit sweeter in this than you do in a regular bourbon barrel ale or a reg or sorry, in a regular <sighs> coffee stout, um, and I think that's another aspect of that bourbon barrel aging coming in. Um, I will agree that it's subtle but this is an excellent beer that i would share with people who tell me people who claim that they don't like beer i would have them drink this 
I think I think you're right on that one. I I, I think this would be a good beer oh, yeah. for somebody that's not a beer person. Yeah. Um, and I think with that, I rate this a three point seven. Three seven. Three point seven. I'll say that, uh, that, that, that that just to be fair, uh, I'm also drinking coffee with this, and I wonder if that's affecting something here too. That yeah, I'm I've drinking been deliberately coffee and avoiding coffee my style. coffee. Yeah, I, I I was doing that at at first, and I, I think it probably mutes the bitters. But I, I stopped drinking my coffee for that for that point, and it um. It, it, it didn't. It didn't do a whole lot for my overall view of it. I mean, the, the same stuff came out that. So we're our. It, it's interesting here that we are. We're kind of. It's, it's kind of a big gap there from a three to a three seven. Yeah, but, uh, th three, three point three, and three point seven. But uh, but you know that's. Uh, I, I think that I think that I think that's pretty fair for a. Uh, you know, for what we're doing here, um, yeah. a, a good beer. Uh, the important questions. Uh, Lawnmower beer, not a lawnmower beer. No. Uh, it, again, it's 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 a cold weather beer to me. It's not a it's not a not a warm weather beer. Um, John, I'm I'm bringing the guns out early on this one. Um, I, I'm going to say first date or even even Hell pre date. Yeah. Um, pre date. This, <laughs> yeah, well, Here, I mean, we, have this beer because I plan on getting you drunk and laying you later. Yeah, I mean, you you meet him at the club. Uh, this definitely isn't going to be a weed out beer. I think it's safe. I, I, I don't think there's a lot of people that you're going to hand this beer to and they're going to say, this is disgusting, unless they just don't like beer. I've yeah, got this if image. they don't like this beer, yes, absolutely kick them the fuck out. I've got this image of John like just walking down the street, finding hot chicks, going, here, drink this. I might ask you out later. Well, I mean, they're mediocre. But... <laughs> yeah. It's whatever it takes, whatever it takes. And, and, the last question, the most oh, important yes. one. It gets you laid. This is a beer <laughs> that if if a girl has a 10-date rule or a 7 or a 5 or a 3-date rule before she'll screw you, this will get her to break that. <laughs> if she's a beer lover, <laughs> which but, she should but, be if you're going to screw her. But not a Bill Cosby beer. It's not heavy no. enough. Oh, no, it is yeah, not a Bill Cosby beer. definitely not a Bill Cosby beer. So, uh, you know, that's what we got to look at here. Yeah. All right. So let's move into the next section, uh, the filibuster, which... I've got to be honest. I am a. Uh, I, I I love the idea of a filibuster. I get excited when filibusters happen. I I cut. I particularly my, like it when they read Dr. Seuss. I, I cut my teeth watching Mr. Smith goes to Washington with uh, that that great that great scene in there where, uh, you know, he he educates the Congress or the Senate on uh, on the Constitution. Reading this, um, filibuster is. Uh, it's a very controversial. John, you have got me using the word "very" and it's killing me. Yeah. Nice, it's killing me. I win. They, yeah, yeah. Fuck you. <laughs> uh, the filibuster has an old tradition. It, it, it dates it dates way well back into into the Roman Empire. But it's this idea that uh, that you can use prolonged speech to obstruct legislation, um, and and it's it, it's something that that's that's happened in in most of your democracies at some point or other. Sometimes it's called voice obstructionism. Sometimes it's called political stonewalling. But it's it's a way of, of at prolonging debate or putting off a vote, preventing a vote at some point. Um, just before we even get into this, I'm kind of curious. Anybody else get excited about filibusters? You know, I, I used to. At one <laughs> point, I was like, yeah. And, and the more and more I've seen on them and researched them... I, I, I've I've found them to be very shallow horse and pony shows, and I, I no longer do. Um, let me ask a I'm question. I'm disappointed in you. Yeah, let me ask a question. I, I hate to break the show real quick. Um, uh, Alex, the producer, uh, there is one more beer here left, and if you don't take it, we're going to split it up. Do you want it? Yeah. All right. Cool. God, bless. It, that's a good producer right yes. there. He gives he, us he, the beer. Fifty percent raise right now. <laughs> right there. Somebody hook we, that man up. Hey, can, go ahead and double your salary. We will pay you twice as much this week. So. I like anything that keeps Congress from doing things. So if um, if a filibuster means that, A, they can't get to other business, and B, they delay like whatever business it is that they're trying to do, I'm all for that. I, I, I am too. And, 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 and to me, what the filibuster really is, is uh, to, to me, the filibuster is, is the greatest example of, of democracy in action. It's... It's a minority. Uh, it's somebody in the minority using the power of their own voice to speak directly to the American people, directly to the Senate, and saying, "You know what? Something unjust is happening, and I am going to stand here and I'm going to fight for as long as I can to try and stop it." And piss my pants. L let me ask you this: 
Uh, and I know there's a difference because we argued in these previous shows about, okay, do it, but be willing to face consequences. And there are no consequences here, right? Except for maybe pissing your pants. But we, we've talked about other types of minority obstructionist actions, uh, especially in our show on uh, uh, civil protests uh civil peace, disobedience. Civil, disobedience. civil disobedience yes one of my favorite shows uh with the sit-ins i like, don't think it's behind the paywall no yeah, i'm pretty is. sure that one is, is it? um oh, so long ago but where, where people would go into the factories and sit in and say we're not going to let yeah. anyone work is there any difference yeah. in this and that yeah i think it is i think the, i think the difference here is that when you do that you are going into somebody else's property and you are you are violating somebody else's rights uh, when you're when you're doing a filibuster, you have been elected to be the voice of the people, and you're using the tools that are put in place to be the voice of that people. Well, yeah, and it, it's public land. It's, it's not their land, but it's not the other people's land either. Yeah. It's public. So, w okay, let me throw another one at you. Let's not go to the factories. Let's talk about these people that block the roads. They go and they form a line and they say, we're blocking public land. They're not anyone's private land. We're blocking the roads. Is there a difference in that and this? I, I think there is because at that point you have, a, you have a right to movement and you're violating somebody's rights. So I, 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 have, I have an issue with that. Does Congress have any right to do their job? I don't know where that would be. Does the well, government itself? Where's your have any right rights? to movement? Well, the Congress. I, I think. I think it's a, it's an it's an implied right by the fact that you that, that that you own yourself and you can move around and there is a right to ha to have roads. There is a right to move between states and and all of this. Well, stuff. isn't there an implied right in Congress when they say you guys do X that they have a right to do X? I don't. I I, I don't think there is. I, I I think there's. I I think there's a. I think there's a uh, a, a job. But I don't think it's a right. I think there's a difference there. I'm gonna have to disagree, but yeah, I'm, yeah. And I, yeah. I see where you're coming yeah. from, but I think there is a difference there. And 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 part of that is the fact that that they're doing this under the rules that are that are put there. Yes, that and, that is true. And they're using they're they're not violating a law or violating a, a a rule when they do this. They're not violating anybody else's rights either. But are the people blocking? And in some cases they are. It differs from state to state. But in the cases where the people blocking the roads, sometimes they're not disobeying a law in fact most of the time they're not disobeying a law well it, 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 again it depends on, on on where you read the law and how you yeah. read it are they are they causing a public disturbance in most places that's yeah. a law well uh but, but you farting know, the but, wrong way can be a public yeah, disturbance yeah, yeah, with the wrong yeah, cop yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, i have a, i have a problem with that i, I yeah. that that having been said if the law is so unjust that that's what you have to do to do it and you're willing to pay the consequences knock yourself out <laughs> Pay the Very well. consequences. Very well. Uh, so good. Yeah. That, that, that's kind of that's kind of where I come from with this. Uh, so I, I like the idea of the filibuster. Um, I, I, I like the fact that that sometimes the minority voice. This is the only way for the minority voice to be heard. Mm -hmm. And uh, and 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 I know there's a, there's a problem with they're they're not effective. Right. They're they're mm -hmm. not effective in the long run. Uh, well, they're not effective in the short run, but sometimes in the long run they are. I think sometimes. they're very effective. These guys keep getting reelected. I think that's what they're doing. It well, for. some of them do. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of them do. Uh, so I, I mentioned that this goes back, yeah. uh, back, back ages and ages. The, yes. the most famous of the of the of the early filibusters, of the ancient filibusters, was a guy named Cato the Younger. Cato, yeah. We need a different word because I knew what you were talking about. But when you say the early filibusters, that could mean the act of filibustering the incident or, or the, the pirates. person yeah. <laughs> filibusters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You got a point. Uh, the act. Yeah. Okay. So the the uh, Cato the younger was a a member of of the Roman Senate, uh, and and he was known for being a voice of the people, and was very much about protecting the Roman Republic. And this is the days when Julius Caesar had had defeated Gaul, and and, and he was this this up and coming uh, person, and. Cato was afraid. Uh, he saw the writing on the wall. And he, he was afraid that if, that Julius Caesar was going to use his popularity to become a dictator. Well, there was a rule uh, in, in in the Roman Senate that all business had to be completed by by, by dusk, Sunday, by dark. Yeah. If it wasn't completed by dark, the next day it had to start again. Yeah. Well, uh, Julius Caesar had his armies, and they were coming into Rome, and. For him to enter with his armies, the Senate had to uh, had, had had to pass a resolution that saying that you could come in here, you could have your parade and all this, and you could you could enter. Uh, Cato filibustered this in order to prevent Julius Caesar from entering because he was afraid that this parade would be what signaled his uh, 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 
rise to, to despotic power. Now, in the end, we know that Julius Caesar ignored it, and he entered in with his army anyway. But yeah, it, didn't it cost him some honorarium? It did. Uh, yeah. he, 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 he did not get, get voted on the Senate to, to get his bonus, basically, yeah. is what it was. But, but you know, to me, this is, this is an example of, of a good use of the filibuster. It's somebody that says, look, I'm using the tools that are, that, that are given me in order to stop something that I see as unjust. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let me ask a, 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 an aside, a side point on this. Uh, when I was doing the research, I, I, that name stood out to me, Cato. Is this at all related to the founding of the Cato Institute? Uh, it's named or, after or the, him. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, be, because he was very much a a, uh, a liberty person and, okay. and d did not want large government. And over, in fact, he ends up getting killed for it. But uh, uh, he was. He, as so many did at yeah, that time. Yeah, yeah. You know. But uh, sometimes you, there's backstabbers running around. That, that's right. <laughs> Well, the filibuster goes on, and, and, and the most recent uh, example of it to, to our history is England. And they do have filibusters in the House of Commons, uh, although they, they tend to be much shorter. I think the longest one is six hours. They're um, also much funner. They are. They go to fist fights yeah, sometimes. They, often, they don't care. Yeah, that's yeah. something a little different. When we came to this country, we, we actually, at first, we had a filibuster in the Senate and the House. Uh, it was something that, that could happen uh, it, it, in both. And, and again, it was done intentionally because we were afraid of the tyranny of the majority. And they wrote this in in the Senate. Now, it's not constitutional. It's in the, 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 the rules of the chambers. Yeah. Uh, they wrote it in in order for the minority to, to have a degree of power over what they would have called the tyranny of the majority. What do you think about that idea that they intentionally put a rule in place in order for the minority to have a vote against the majority? Here, here. Well, let me let me speak from two different places here. <laughs> as a uh, as a small government guy, one is going to be out of his mouth. The other is going to be out of his ass. It's going to be strange for him to actually speak out of his mouth for something once. different. Which yeah. is which, though? That's the question you got to answer. Uh, John I think we'll be able to tell. As a well, which one's speaking? Which time? Anyway, uh, as a small she government has two guy. Asses. <laughs> As a small government guy, I, I do like the idea of impeding the business of impeding my rights, right? So I have a personal interest where I say that, that that's a really good idea. But as someone who is is somewhat learned, I'll say, I'm a, I'm a member of, of the National Association of Parliamentarians, and I preside over meetings on a fairly regular basis. There's going to be a really big one coming up, in which I'm very likely going to be the presiding officer should the convention decide to have me. Um, from that perspective, this is a horrible idea. I, I would not accept that. And it, I honestly, in the, in the bodies I preside over, they have very liberal rules on, on their limits on debate. They actually take the default ones, which most parliamentarians agree are not sufficient for limiting debate and getting to business. Uh, but we, we accept those because it's something, but it's very little. It allows 10 minutes of speech, two times per person, in a body of 30 people. You can do some quick math there and figure out how long we can take one issue and drag it out, and we do. Goddamn right we do. <laughs> it, is, it is supremely inefficient. And, and, oh, not and, efficient yeah. at all. You're right. And um, it, it allows, whenever you have stuff like that, what ends up getting put to the front of agendas is not necessarily the most important thing. It's actually a lot of times the most controversial thing. They want to get to that fight. Unless you have a very wise body who, who realizes the writing on the wall and puts it to the back. And so what you'll have is a very controversial topic up here that people want to fight over and a bunch of very uncontroversial, important things. Uh, maybe we're talking about appropriating funding to pay the janitor who is cleaning this place. I mean, just very mundane things. And they have this big fight, and there's a spillover from this that will mess up everything else, when in reality, if we could have just let the body deal with it. Honestly, if this is what the majority wants, and the president wants to sign it, or the states want to ratify it, depending on what's going on, uh, and all these things, all these safeguards that already exist in the Constitution, if it's going to get through all those, all we're going to do is mess up the schedule up here and screw up all the other things that aren't going to be controversial. See, as someone See, who is it's never... out of his ass. It's yeah. out of his ass again. See, as somebody who has no desire at all to 
oversee a deliberative body, um, but loves to be on them and use these particular tools to make <laughs> sure that the minority does get heard. I find myself in the minority a lot. Um, I believe that. Fuck off. <laughs> it's only because other people are stupid. <laughs> here, here. <laughs> Cheers. But, um... That's a fucking cop out, John. A like, uh, cop out for what? I mean, what am I copping out of? I, 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 I think, I think that you that you uh, you damage your small government bona fides with that. Uh, um, I, I think that that uh, this is a tool to keep government small. It's a yep. it's a tool to stop things from happening. If, and, uh, and, and but but I will agree with you. It is completely inefficient. Yeah. Well, I, I would I would argue either. And I, I, I'm going to go to an argument that, that's been used on, on other things before. Either this tool is an enabler of the government we have, or it's completely inefficient at doing anything. Yeah, well, part of that is part of that is that, that, that where the filibuster works is when government is closely divided. Yeah. Uh, if if one party has has uh, has sixty percent of the of, of the majority, which honestly has been a large part of our history. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why you didn't see a lot of filibusters from 1940 to 1980. Uh, the Democrats controlled the House and the Senate in such majorities that, that it was hard to, to, to do it. Right. Uh, in fact, it was only when Democrats filibustered their own party that that, <laughs> that, that they happened uh, yeah. in, in that time period. Uh, but I think it's that I, takes I, balls. I think it's something that 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 is important. Uh, I want to talk about two different kinds of filibusters uh, because we're going to talk about the Senate because the House. They outlawed it in 1848. They they decided that, and and they had good reasoning. But with 435 members, they the, a filibuster would prevent anything from ever happening. The Senate was different, mm. and the Senate intentionally kept the filibuster there because the thought was, senators were supposed be. to be senators were sp supposed to be uh, a little more thoughtful, a little more mature. Yeah, and it's the that, upper house. Yeah, that, that's why. You had to be thirty instead of twenty-five, <laughs> and there were six-year terms, and you had to right. you had a longer citizenship requirement. It was about having a more mature uh, person, and most of the time, your senators were the voice of the states. That, that at that time, the Seventeenth Amendment hadn't changed that yet, so it was you know they were selected by state legislators. They were usually former congressmen. They were usually somebody that had been in the House before. It was something different, uh, and. When the Senate came up, kept this, they kept what was called the silent filibuster and the voice filibuster. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. uh, and the silent filibuster is one that I'm glad is gone. Uh, uh, because the silent filibuster, what it was, it was really a denying quorum trick. What yeah. they would do with the silent filibuster was uh, they would be in the chamber and when they would have a roll call, they would just refuse to answer. So they would be in there. They'd watch everything, but because they didn't answer the roll call, they wouldn't have have the quorum. It was a, it was a way of stopping things through what they called a silent filibuster. Uh, in the 1940s, that's going to be uh, that's going to be stopped when the the Senate President Pro Tem he locks the doors of the Senate, locks the doors, <laughs> and then orders the uh, uh, the uh, uh, clerk of the of, of the Senate to uh, to to record everybody that was that was there, whether they answered or not. I've got. I love the imagery here. I wish there was video of it because they said that uh, the senators were hiding under their desks, trying to hide, and they were hiding behind each other and and trying to escape in the cloakroom. And all these doors were locked, and uh, you know th this this tyrant was was abusing the powers of of, of, the, the, of democracy. But that's that's since since gone. Uh, here, here. Uh, what do you think about the idea of a silent uh, filibuster? I support it. Really, of being able to stand in the chamber and, and, and not answer a roll call? She, she well, doesn't need that. She's denied quorum plenty of times by running out of the room. I have led charges out of the room. I Thank know you, you very have. much. I'm well aware. Anyway. But, um, but no, I mean, I, I, I think if you are going to use the tactic of denying quorum, I, I do think that you should leave, but um, in the... In the instance that somebody's willing to lock you in a room, um, I mean, I think you use whatever tools necessary. I yeah. mean, hell, we saw what this morning, uh, a story where Abraham Lincoln jumped out a window 
<laughs> to um, deny quorum. Yeah, like yeah. you do whatever you have to when when people. God, I miss those days. Uh, yeah, the good old days when you jumped out the window. <laughs> Just jump out windows. So uh, yeah, I'm I'm really happy gone. the uh, the silent filibuster is gone because honestly, this is an instance of the minority wanting to have their cake and eat it too. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, we're gonna be here. We're gonna be able to talk and we're gonna be able to plan and listen, but we're not going to. Uh, yeah. So, oh, so they could still participate. They, they could show up no. when they wanted. They couldn't participate publicly, but there's nothing to stop them from getting with other members and talking mm. to them and lobbying. And, and I do see problem with that. Yeah, yeah. Like if you're not going to be on record as being present, you can't participate. Yeah. Well, and and so Robert's rules actually talks about this kind of thing. It, it talks about denying quorum, and and when and where that should occur, and some of the risks involved, and and what it says very in very explicit terms is that uh, while denying quorum can be done, y you you often are better off not to do it for the very reason that when you deny quorum, you lose your voice in that body. And whatever happens in that body in your absence is in some way your own responsibility because you weren't there to say anything yeah, about yeah. it. Which is why I only do it whenever I know I've got enough to make sure that there is isn't. Is yeah. not actually quorum. You don't yeah. do that shit by yourself. So whenever you sit shit. there and you leave the room, I, podcast air quotes, leave the room, but you're still there and you get to say, no, 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 I'm here now. I'm here now. And you really kind of, now you're kind of violating the rights of deliberation and and of, of business of the people who are there doing their job. So it's one thing to say, I'm going to have gall and I'm going to leave because I don't want to be part of this. And there's legitimate reasons to do it. One of them is a tyrannical chair. But you don't just get to do it because you want to. The very fact, the reason for for quorum is to make sure the body is representative of the people. It's not to make sure that the business you don't want ha to happen doesn't happen. It's to make sure that there's enough people there to give all views. And when you're there and you have the ability to give your view, you have then entered into a social contract where you have said, because I'm here... We get to go through this process of doing business. So yeah, I, I, I agree. I want to. I want to go in more into quorum in a minute. Let's, yeah. let's finish yeah, this discussion absolutely. on filibuster because 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 to me filibuster is really the meat of this. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, you've got these situations. What does it require to break a filibuster? It, it depends on the rules of that body. Okay. I mean, so where are you talking in the about? Uh, in the Senate, isn't it? Two three fifths, three fifths, three fifths, sixty percent, right? Yeah, three fifths uh, it, it is what it requires. Uh, as a result of the fact that that this is there, we now have the ha, have this situation of, of inefficiency that you brought up earlier, where uh, you know we don't even have to filibuster anymore. We're at the point where where a minority can threaten a filibuster and and. And stop things from happening, and they won't even bring a vote up unless they're sure. They I have, love that idea. Unless they have three fifths. I'm with that because when when you when you, we talk about what I said earlier of the 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 battles of this issue spilling over into the next, I love that because if if they go in and they say we have the numbers to filibuster, and they say okay. We're not even going to address that. You've you've prevented that spillover, and great, the minority has had their and, opportunity. And, and business gets to continue. Exactly. So and that's that, fine. And that's what happens is is they they end up just dealing with non controversial legislation, uh, and and that that's why your your big filibusters tend to happen at the end of a cycle. Yeah. Because we've pushed that stuff off. So that to me that kind of solves the inefficiency problem. Is you know okay we funded the government we did what we have to. Now we're going to deal with this controversial issue. And I don't know how you do it because part of the reason that more of those minority filibusters don't happen is they don't want to go through the act of doing it and the publicity of it. So you can't completely take that away. But if they could find some way to encode that way of pushing things back without the actual filibuster, I would even be in support of that. Of yeah. like, you, you get these numbers, you, you show that you're going to do it. Boom. You, you, you've, you've got your I, I'm fine with that yeah okay that, that, so, so, so that, that, that kind of I, I want to talk about a couple of one two more key filibusters because I, I found these fascinating again I love the idea of the, of the, of the minority uh, person standing up and educating the people yeah. uh, the, probably the two most famous of the of the filibusters uh, are Huey Long and Strom Thurmond of course Rand Paul's a big one now but, but yeah. you know you've got uh, Huey Long in the in the 1930s uh, he was running for president, challenging Franklin Roosevelt for the presidency, and Roosevelt had had passed through the National Recovery Act, uh, which, which 
funneled a ton of money to, to the private sector, a ton of money. And Yui Long uh, w was against it. So he came, Yui Long came in and he gave a, uh, a 15-hour filibuster. Now, the rules of the filibuster in the Senate, uh, you can't stop talking for more than a minute. You can't sit down. The only thing you can do is, is you, can, uh, um, you can yield the floor to a question. If you yield the floor, uh, floor period, then you don't get the floor back unless the, the, the speaker uh, gives it back to you. But you could yield the floor for a question. Yui Long held the floor for 15 hours. Uh, he read the entirety of the Declaration of Independence, the entirety of the Constitution, while discussing the points of it uh, as they're going through. Uh, as they're going through it, he read chunks of the Federalist Papers to this. And when he ran out of things to, to, to talk about, Yui Long told the members of the chamber that he will now give advice to anybody that needs advice. <laughs> the, the Senate, the Senate wanted to kill this and, and, and refused to participate. So he had no. So people in the peanut gallery up above that were watching this wanted Yui Long to keep going. So they would write questions on paper and make paper airplanes out of it and shoot it down to him, and he would answer and give give, give advice. I would have so totally Yui Long from the Senate floor was giving people marital advice and uh, all uh, all kinds of advice from this. Uh, not the right person to get marital advice from, by the way. I Yui have... Long was a drunk and an adulterer, but uh, you know it, it, it was it was interesting that he held the floor for fifteen hours. You know what broke it? Hmm. Come, come on, you, you got to know what broke Yui Long. He shit his pants. He had to pee. He had to pee, and you, 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 he wasn't. Nobody would yield for a question long enough for him to uh, escape to the cloakroom. Uh, <laughs> so he, he ends up breaking it after fifteen hours. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now they just get a catheter and a little bag. Uh, that, that, in Texas, they do anyway. Yeah. 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 Uh, the, the the second one is Strom Thurmond, who uh, I, I have I have very little use for Strom Thurmond. Uh, Strom Thurmond was a uh, was was a congressman from uh, from South Carolina. Uh, and he, he ran as a Dixiecrat against, against Harry Truman, so you know how long he, he'd been there. He's the longest-serving senator in the history of, of, of the Senate. Uh, Robert Byrd was, and, and Strom Thurmond passed it. He's the only senator ever to serve past his 100th birthday. Uh, but Strom Thurmond— Bernie's fucking trying, isn't he? Yeah, Strom, <laughs> Strom Thurmond uh, fought against the Civil Rights Act of 1955, Um and he, he, he spoke for, for 24 hours, I'm sorry, 1957, 24 hours and 18 minutes. And they talk about what Strom Thurmond did. He, uh, uh, he, he, he re re refrained from drinking water for two days and went and sat in a sauna in order to bleed his body so he wouldn't have to go to the bathroom while he was in there. Uh, another one that, 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 that you know, read the Constitution discussed this. By the end of it, he's reading, uh, he's reading cookbooks and telling people how to make illegal pot liquor on your, uh, uh, in, in your <laughs> kitchen, how to make, how to make, make alcohol illegally. Um, but not any, what I thought when you said pot liquor. See, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's too bad that they didn't have YouTube then because somebody could have gotten on YouTube and done a live stream of following the instructions as he spoke. <laughs> yeah. Well, I actually wanted to ask a question like yep. with the whole advice thing from with Huey Long, what would that have looked like today in the in the Internet age where polls name a, a new ship, Bodie McBoatface and things like that? Like that would have been hilarious. Would not have been legitimate questions about like how do I get my wife to yeah. stop being angry at me or yeah. some it, shit like that. It, 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 it would have been the, the best. Switch water. Let's be honest; it would be it would be sex questions mostly. Yeah. 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 What position do you like best? Uh, how should I propose to my my blow up sex doll? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, interestingly enough, Strom Thurmond, with this longest record uh, on on history of the filibuster, um, at the end of it. Uh, you know he, he's forced to, uh, to he's forced to leave. Although, you know he had a lot of people that, that helped him out. The uh, a lot of people had come in and would you yield for a question, and then they would spend twenty minutes to ask a question, <laughs> so he could he could get get a little bit of a rest. Um, uh, with Strom Thurmond, they even they even put a temporary bathroom in the cloakroom so he could leave one foot in the chamber and pull the door closed and and, and urinate and he'd come back. Uh, but. Uh, <laughs> They, uh, uh, you know, within within a few minutes of the of it being being uh, of, of it ending, they passed the Civil Rights Act anyway. So yeah. it wasn't effective at what it did, but it it made a celebrity out of him. And it, it you know it made his argument that what he believed was a was an unjust legislation. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm glad it passed, but mm -hmm. but I, I like the idea of somebody being able to to do this. Um, yeah. 
So th- th- those are kind of two of the, the most famous. Of course, you know, Rand Paul's. Yeah. Was it 13 hours in Rand Paul's? Yeah, and he had so, printed yeah. the entire tax code. And, yeah, and, and his, he did a whole YouTube thing before that. And his was not a real a, a, a real filibuster at all because they uh, the, they the, the majority leader uh, allowed him to recess temporarily. They would recess and he would come back and, and pick yeah, up his it, filibuster. Yeah, it was kind of a... Um, they adjusted the rules. Yeah, well, well, I was going to say an entertained filibuster. Like, yeah. it, it almost felt like they had gone behind doors and he's like, look, I'm going to do this thing. Give me 10 hours or whatever the time. I don't even remember how long it was. I think it was 13. Give me 13 yeah. hours and then we'll pass it afterward. They said, what, all right. What I liked about Rand Paul's filibuster, though, was that, that it... it it wasn't a it wasn't a complete waste of time to me. It was a, he was reading things that were that, that made sense and that were educational and that were pertinent. And uh, I kind of liked that. Um, Who read Doctor Seuss? I remember Ted, someone Ted reading. Ted Cruz, Ted Cruz read, that, okay. read that to his daughter as a as a bedtime story uh, so she could live because he he was running for president. Mm-hmm. Remember, so he said, uh, "I read I read a story to my daughter every night, so forgive me." And read it to her on C-SPAN. I remember that. Yeah. Now. Okay. Yeah. That was a that was a publicity stunt if I ever saw it. Yeah, fuck uh, him. I don't believe he reads it to his daughter every night, but you know, whatever. All right, so let's go to quorum. Quorum. What is quorum? Quorum is the minimum number of people required by anybody uh, to do business. Well, I'm going to go on because I can give you like oodles on quorum. I think that's it, all it, 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 it's basically the idea that you have to have a a, a minority, so a, a certain a, amount, so the minority can't force an opinion down on you. Yeah, yeah. Um, Robert's rule specifically writes that, uh, and I, I kind of mentioned this earlier that it it is it the reason for it is to prevent an unrepresentative body from doing business. And Robert's rules goes on to write to say that it, it, it prescribes a baseline quorum of 50% plus one, but it further uh, prescribes that bodies don't adopt that quorum. They actually set their own rules for quorum and that quorum should be the minimum number that can be expected to attend in fair weather conditions. Yeah. Uh, I, I find it interesting that the, the, the quorum rules that we have now, because they used to be very, very uh, uh, lax. Yeah. Uh, today, the, uh, the, 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 according to the, the, the rules in both the House and the Senate, the, uh, you, you can have a quorum call. And if you can legitimately get there and you don't get there, the the uh, presiding officer can put an arrest warrant out for you. Yeah. Uh, for for failure to attend, it's the same thing as, as failure to attend a, a court proceeding. Mm-hmm. Only in government bodies. In government bodies, yes. yeah. Uh, which I found interesting because I can remember uh, uh, cases of uh, here in Texas Oklahoma. in in two thousand four when the. Uh, uh, the, the WD forties, they called themselves the white Democrats over 40 that were members of the house, uh, fled to Ardmore, Oklahoma to prevent a vote. Uh, and they, they, uh, they put an arrest warrant out for him. Now it was an arrest warrant in Texas and they were in Oklahoma, so they couldn't do anything. They were literally right across Can't the, the border. Can the Texas Rangers go anywhere? Uh, well, well that, sometimes they do, but no, they, <laughs> they, they, they can't. Uh, so if, if they call up, if, if they call it this roll call and, and you don't come in for the, for the roll call, uh, you're you're in violation of of, of a uh, of a court, and you can be arrested for it. What do y'all think of that? Well, and and let me let me give some or ask for some clarification on that. Can you be arrested for a crime, or can you just be compelled to attend? Because my understanding is that, for instance, when the Democrats came back, they weren't in j- put in jail for not attending. But no, what they, they just can, lost their parking spaces. Yeah, what they can do is, and this has actually happened before with uh, in, in, in extreme events, they can literally grab you and drag you down the hallway and say, you're here now. Uh, well, apparently they, they, they can arrest you and they, okay. they don't do it often because uh, I'm looking at a case in 1988 when Robert Byrd, at the time he was the majority leader, uh, he... The the Republicans had walked out of the of, of the of the the Senate in order to prevent a quorum, and uh, to, to to show what was going on, they were, uh, you know, they they were they were hiding out in different places. And Robert Byrd comes through, and uh, there was enough votes in there that he was able to uh, to, to get a vote to have them. Uh, uh, compelled to come and one of the guys bob packwood of oregon then a senator before he was was disgraced there were 46 republicans uh bob packwood was one of them bob packwood was was not able to get out of the building fast enough uh and they found him huddled in his office and they ended up uh, arresting him dragging him through the hallway of the senate and forcing him into the uh the chamber i think i was stripped down naked before they could grab me here's here's the one that i'm surprised hasn't happened yet right um 
you, you you have all these moves that the the gun lobbyists have used, or or, or the gun, the 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 pro gun organizations have used in order to prevent gun restrictions going through. Why haven't they gotten a group of senators to agree to filibuster? And go to a public place. At which point, the militia would show up there to defend them from from being compelled <laughs> to to show up. And if the cops want to come in and compel them, you you might you yeah, might I have. I don't, I don't think we want gunfights. I don't think we want. Yeah, the they okay don't want to be. A, they don't want to be associated with the militias. That's why. Yeah, yeah. Cause it's a good way to lose elections. Yeah. Uh, and and, and to, to show it's a good way to lose, even when they didn't do that, most of the WD forties in Texas that fled to Ardmore lost their reelection bid. Mm. Most of them did off that over that, so yeah. uh, that that kind of thing uh, that thing happens. Uh, you know, uh, we, we've had we've had a lot of these thing these cases out there. Uh, I kind of like the idea of, of 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 a legislative body being able to compel you to attend if you are able to. Now, if you're not able, I think that that might be a different situation. They pull you out of surgery. Come on, yeah. we're going. You know, now uh, able means. Yeah, if you're in the chamber, I don't yeah. think they should come to your house and get you or anything. But I, I do, I do think that if you're if you're hiding in your office in the Capitol, then, then you're not really denying quorum. See, you're yeah. playing both sides there to me. See, and and here's my argument on that. I don't think they should be able to compel you to come, even if. And I've seen this one. I'll give you an example of, of a vote where I presided over the meeting and quorum was intentionally denied. So the situation was this. Uh, there was. Were you one of the ones that denied it? Hell yeah, I was. <laughs> she, it wouldn't be her first time. Um, Won't be my last. Yeah. So th there were two factions in this body on a very contentious issue. Uh, in order for the body to enter into a lawsuit or not. Mm -hmm. And we had adjourned for lunch. And for various reasons, lunch had gone a little long. Well, the minority group had very wisely not gone to lunch or eaten very lightly and then returned early. The majority group had gone and, and sat in the restaurant eating a full lunch. Well, they're all trying to pay their tickets, which is a very one by one process. Oh, it was taking forever. And they're all trying to like, come on, we, we got to get back to the meeting. And the minority group had had this very smart plan. As soon as the 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 quorum making person went in, they were going to push to to call the vote, call all pending questions with the minority of the majority in the room. So what the majority group did is they waited outside denying quorum until the whole group was there and then flooded in. We're all here, you know, um, as, as a procedural thing. And I think that was brilliant. I think it was a proper use of denying quorum. Now, let's look at the situation. And it pissed them off so Yeah, they were bad. mad. They were sending out pictures of, look, your people aren't doing their job, which that was the wise yeah, of yeah, them. They, yeah. they, they weren't doing their job. You're yeah. right. Um, so, all that said, let's look at the majority of cases in which quorum was denied. The majority of cases in which quorum was denied, because I do believe that Senate and House are both a majority quorum requirement, 50% plus one, right? Yeah. Okay. So in that particular case, if you really do have the majority, you have to say that some of your people aren't present too, right? And the minority is just kind of pushing that over the edge because they are, as you say, a minority. So in that case, I don't think you should compel the minority to come. I think you should call the people who actually agree with you if they do agree with you and say, get your ass down here. Yeah. We got to pass this vote. So Otherwise that's Otherwise you are a minority. Yeah. Or, or, and and th that's the point. If, if it's the case that there aren't enough people who actually agree with you to show up to pass this vote, then this is the minority putting a physical tyranny on the majority to get the people in there. So I, I, I disagree with the, the concept of... You know, uh, side note, I, I wasn't planning on saying this, but you reminded me of a story. When Andrew Johnson was vice president, uh, the, uh, the I've forgotten what the vote was. It was one of the Civil Rights Act. Uh, and uh, he you know he's president pro tem of the Senate. And he looked at it and there were not enough... You know, there weren't enough votes to, to do anything, so he went over to Blair House across the street to take a nap and left it in, left the uh, Senate in charge uh, of, of the, the next presiding officer. And the next presiding officer made some made some contacts there, called people in, and pushed through legislation to stop Andrew Johnson's uh, 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 planned bill because he was taking a nap during this. He was he was able to, to do this. You, and he, he called court. He, he he worked the quorum. And yeah. that's exactly why Roberts Rules prescribed us as a, as a last ditch effort. Uh, 
and it, it prescribes it as a right because if you can by yourself leaving push the body past losing quorum that means there was only barely a quorum it was narrow. it was it was a questionably yeah. a represented, narrow majority yeah it was a questionably questionably represented body and you're like well this isn't right i'm gonna leave but the reason roberts rules advises against this is when you do go across the street and take a nap you lose your rights to that body. So good on him yeah, for, yeah, you know. Yeah. Good use of it. Yeah. All right. So that kind of covers the, uh, you know, the, these tools in the Senate. What do y'all think? Uh, kind of, anybody move anywhere? No, I mean, I, I'm, I, I am in favor of minority obstructionist actions uh, with limits on them. I, I don't, I don't believe in free range minority yeah. obstructionist actions because uh, at the point that you just say, uh, the minority can do whatever it wants to stop whatever it wants. You've you've really broken down the entire legislative system as a whole. I mean, yeah. it really needs to be a a, a reined in thing and only used in specific instances. For instance, I talked yeah. about quorum where it was only barely represented body when there's some question over the majority. Yeah, Super majority I, I, shouldn't be I'm, stopped. I'm, I'm really surprised that, that that's your word. You are uh, yeah. Anna. Um, for myself, I I don't think I've moved necessarily. Um, I, I really respect when people, because denying quorum, and I can say this, I've done it, costs a lot of political capital. It does. It does. Um, filibustering costs a lot of, of political capital. It does. It, absolutely. Um, and I, I respect people who are willing to expend that capital it, to stand it can up build for capital something. Too, though. It, it can. Well, it, and it depends on the environment that you're it, in. It, it launched, I've been it launched in both Rand, cases. Paul as a, Rand Paul as a presidential candidate, really. I mean, yeah. But I, I've been in situations where it did both. Yeah. Um, but I, I respect people being willing to expend that political capital. Um, I like that there are protections for the minority um, to, at the very least, be heard. Um, and and have the opportunity to debate and and become the majority um, because that's what I see a filibuster as being um, or denying quorum as an opportunity to you know try to bring people there that agree with you or try to sway the minds of people who don't agree with you um, and I guess I have to say even if those didn't exist. I would hope that people would still stand up anyway. I, I can tell you this. Um, I would I would more than happily, and I have anticipated having to do this before, um, stand up and completely violate whatever uh, whatever rules of order there are in a given meeting or or organizational thing. He's nodding. Yeah. I will not um, bail you out when I call the cops on you. Oh, Just letting oh, you know. I know. And, but. Um, I got your back. But. Have, <laughs> thank, I appreciate that, Mike. But have had to measure whether or not it was worth potentially getting kicked out. Potentially. Having your husband arrest you? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I will visit you just to smile. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I have, because he's the chair on a on a body that I am, I'm also on, I have wholly anticipated telling him, I'm not shutting up. You're going to have to have somebody haul me out. And so whether those tools exist or not, I think there are people who will stand up for the things that they believe are right. And I think that this facilitates the weaker people also having the balls to do yeah, that. Yeah. But I think there are going to be people with balls anyway. I, I, I disagree with the direction or, or, or the, the distance you go with this. I, I think you should, yeah. should operate inside the rules. That having been said, the, rules, there are the, rules, circumstances. Are, the rules are in place and, and you should use those rules. Therefore, I, I, I like the filibuster. I, I like denying quorum, but I like it less than I do the rest of them. Right. Uh, uh, it's an extreme it, measure. It's an extreme measure that it's has to nuke. happen on some time. It, it, it's the nuclear option right there. But uh, although, you know, they call the filibuster that. But uh, but I, I, I really, really like the, the filibuster. I think it's something that's an educational tool. It's a way of, of getting the, 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 the point across. Um and uh, as far as shutdowns go, I think we should shut down the government more often. Uh, real shutdowns. Actually real shut, down. shut it down. Real shutdowns, yeah. yeah. One, one thing I, I do want to point out is is all of these measures have been uh, 
given the, re the, the reputation of being liberty measures, things to put forward more liberty, and they've been, been used that way, but the only reason they've been used that way is because my, liberty's been so much in the minority. Right. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're minority tools is what they are. Yeah. Yeah. But, and we saw this with the Civil Rights Act, it could just as easily be used sure. for, for tyranny. It could just as easily be used to deny uh, people their, their civil, civil rights. Yeah, yeah. And there is no inherent reason why it should be a liberty tool. And, you know, I guess the... the, the well, um, the Nazis used the tool. Yeah. The Nazis denied quorum in order to, 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 to hold power. Well, and... and, and it can be done. And, and the analog I would use, and, and we, kind of, we, we talked about this again in a previous show, when we talked about um, uh, uh, jury nullification... What we talked about, what, the way it's it's been talked about a lot of like, well, just say innocent if he's innocent, if, if he's guilty because you don't believe it should be a crime. But it could just as easily be used the other way to say guilty on someone where you know for a fact they didn't do it, but you just don't like the yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah. That's, that, that's true. That's true. All right. So uh, this was a lot of fun. I enjoyed doing it. I, I tell you, I, I, I really poured myself into this one. Mm -hmm. I, I enjoyed yeah. uh, looking all this stuff up. So I, you know, these are the kind of topics I like to do. Yeah. Uh, I. I, I was kind of expecting to have have a little more disagreement on this one, a little more uh, vocalness. But I, I, I guess I, I'm always surprised where everybody is. So yeah, yeah. All right, uh, that's what I got for you guys. It's been fun. It has yeah. been fun. All right. Well, uh, with that, uh, hey. If somebody wanted to support this show, what could they do? Yeah, there's there's a couple uh, big ways you can get involved. One, like, share with your friends, find the people that you think would enjoy this and help us out there. Uh, and if you want to support us financially, and we could use it. In fact, uh, uh, we, we've, we've just started uh, documenting all the projects we would like to do yeah, to yeah. grow the show. Um, you can go to patreon.com slash sixpackphilosophy. If donations aren't your thing, you want a little swag, teespring.com slash sixpackphilosophy. You can get those T-shirts yeah. or uh, you know, this, 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 this canvas back this here or cool. some, some pretty cool little uh, koozies, koozies. aren't on there. You have to go to uh, Patreon. got to go to Patreon, Patreon for koozies. Yeah. 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 Or uh, come to one of our remotes. Or come yes. to one of our remotes. And if you give us enough money, you can sleep with one of the hosts. Um, I'm, I'm available. Okay. That's just his thing. That's just that's, my thing. That's not on Teespring. I don't know about the other. It's yeah. not on Teespring. You've got, <laughs> no. you've got to come to a remote for that one. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> He'll screw you in a bathroom. Right That's what he's saying. <laughs> no, sorry. Anyway. He'll keep one foot on the floor, though, so he can continue to debate. Legal. Yes. Legal. Before we get too far in this, thank you guys so much for tuning in. We Whoa. Had a Every week. Every it week. seems like every week. We got a recommendation this week. We got to recommend. <laughs> we only just started this. I forgot. I know, but we forgot like three times in a row. Okay. This week, our recommendation is Crash Course. If you have not checked out the Crash oh, yeah. Course series on YouTube, it's great. All of them. All yeah. Of them. All of them are great. They're doing one on theater right now, but I specifically wanted to recommend Crash Course because they have a really great series. They do sub-series within there called Crash Course Government, where you can learn about yeah. a lot of the different uh, government things going on. So specifically, check out Crash Course Government, but Crash Course, crash course, course is, great. is great too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, chemistry. I, I didn't. I didn't like. I their, don't know. I don't do chemistry. <laughs> I hate it. Save I me. still hate. It. I think it's still going on. I hate their sociology series. <laughs> Haven't seen it. <clears throat> but it's all the more reason I watch it terrible. because it it makes me so angry. But it's probably something if it makes me angry that I need to be yeah, probably probably listening yeah, probably. to. So. so so with that. With that, you can do it now. You can do With, your yeah, spiel. I can yeah, do it now. Yeah, yeah. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We've had fun, and we hope you have too. Uh, cheers. It was okay. We'll yeah. see you next week. All right, next week. Cheers. Cheers. Six Pack Philosophy is supported by independent philosophers just like you. If you would like to support us, go to sixpackphilosophy.com and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. 